Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Skyrim audio adventure. And this is it. We made it. This is the end of the first season, if you can call, if you can call it a first season, when it took me five years to make. And my goodness, what a journey it has been. I am a little bit disappointed because I have to start this episode with a bit of a disclaimer. I had a whole six-minute tavern song sequence that I had written and gotten prepared for the end of this. I wasn't even going to talk at the end. I was just going to have this song sort of play us out. Unfortunately, I ran into some hurdles when it came to the musical production of the song. I had written instrumental parts for instruments that I don't play and I needed to get players. And when I sent the song off to my producer, he just happened to be having very uh, substantial technical difficulties at the same time that would require an extra few months just to get around the difficulties so he could start working on it. And we really, we just needed to let it go. And so I have actually cut a corner here and replaced that ending tavern song with the song Soldier, Poet, King by the Oh Hellos, specifically the version pulled off of YouTube, the YouTube channel EL underscore Ashes exclamation point. I'm very disappointed, and I hope that I can be forgiven for that. Now, on to the positives. I had no idea that we were going to get this far. I had no idea when I made that first episode what it was going to be and that people were going to like it. I generally don't put out a lot of the creative things that I make. I've been creative my whole life, but I haven't really put a lot out there. And that was like the first time I'd ever gotten that kind of response. And I put it up on a whim on one night when I was in college. And, and now here we are at the end of the first season. I can't believe it. And it's all thanks to you guys. It's all thanks to my family and my friends, my lovely, lovely wife. And also my supporters on Patreon who not only have helped me get better gear, but also helped me justify all this to my family. I just got to run down the list right now. I love you all. Ken's Ghost, Jared Neo, Say, Al Barrio, The Red Guard, Tupac of Skyrim, B Moody, 91, Samantha Cakebread, Gungeon, 4143, Ryan Abrahamson, Clyde Booth, Eric Upchurch, Eden's Rest, Joanna Howard, Matt Dombrowski, Carol Avery, Carl. Ah. <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious, you guys are kings, queens, and celestial beings. Speaking of kings, shout out to Chi Lee, who once again has lent his voice to this episode in the role of the young guardsman. Shout out to Ongoing Still on Discord, who provided an awesome piece of custom artwork that is heavily featured in this episode. You can find more of their work at Codex Vertigree's Art. And on Instagram, at Codex Vertigrees, the O in the word Codex is a zero in that particular handle. I'll put all the links in the description, rest assured. And finally, it seems like a good time for me personally to just acknowledge those who have passed away in my life, who supported me through the inception of this project and did not leave to see it through to, its, uh, to this particular stage. My grandmother, Ruthie, my friend, Paul, my cat, Allie, who was the inspiration for the name of this channel and my whole internet handle. That was all my cat, Allie. And most recently, my grandma, Paula. I'm no expert on the afterlife or anything like that. I'm not going to expound my philosophy on that, but I hope that I get the chance to see you all again. With that vital stuff said, let's get into part three of chapter 15 of the Skyrim audio adventure, The Necromancer. Priestess? Priestess, I think he's waking up. 
Interminable ages of man, myrrh, and beast folk had passed since the hunter's ears had last managed to ferry sound across the wailing black of his mind. The simple act of parting his lips to take a waking breath felt like he was splitting the land itself, pulling a canyon into being. The sound of his breath carried the hiss of a whisper. It was labored, but it was steady. The rest of his body felt numb and distant, but that was a little cause for concern. For now, he just needed to find a way out of his head. A moment's pushing and he was finally able to crack the seal on his left eyelid. It creaked open like windows with old rusty hinges. The right eye remained stubbornly shut. Blurry brightness before him coalesced into the green light of morning seeping in through a high window. A face drifted into view. A dreadful, sickening grin. A niece, features still locked in her jowly death mask, eyes of black and teeth of green. Her grin split, and he saw layers upon layers of jaws opening in an ever enfurling void of crooked fangs. The hunter's heart surged with adrenaline, and his arms shot out, reaching for her neck. She had to die. She must die! The face floated away and he leaned after it, stretching, clawing, his own teeth gritting in grim determination, eyes wide with hate and fear. He leaned too far and gravity took him. He flopped unceremoniously onto the wooden floor. Pain caught up with him at last, lancing through all his being like a lightning strike splits a tree. Damn it, Ayala, why didn't you catch him? Scolded a familiar voice. He was being a fool, came an even more familiar voice. Fine, fine, just help him up, will you? Yeah, I'm on it. A hand came into view and cradled his head, supporting his neck. It stung terribly as it pressed into the right side of his face, but he didn't flinch away. This touch was not meant to hurt him. Another gentle arm helped him turn onto his side, his one eye blinking, still very unsure where he was. He looked up into the smooth, beautiful face of Ayala the Huntress. She was scowling irritably, but forced a soft smile when she met his gaze, auburn hair cascading around them like a curtain defining this small place of safety. Hey, stranger, she said. I've got to get you back in your bed. Don't try to kill me this time. Ayala reached for his hand, intending to pull him up just enough to wrangle him over the edge of the bed. However, the hunter turned into her, burying his face in her belly and wrapping his arms around her waist. She was taken aback as he pushed her onto her haunches and back against the end table. She reached up to stop anything from falling and looked on in awkward amazement as Stranger curled into her and began shaking violently. It took Ayala several seconds to realize that he was sobbing, whimpering like a scared child. She could feel the wet spot on her abdomen growing as his tears and snot flowed unconstrained by shame or pride. Unsure how to feel about it, she averted her eyes, suddenly very interested in the rafters. Her hand came up and began tenderly stroking what hair he had left. The room was silent but for the sound of the man's heaving breaths. Ayala met Danica's sympathetic eye. I think we should shut the door. felt like two hours, but could have easily been thirty minutes later. The hunter was alone, sitting in his bed, mind moving like molasses as he took stock of himself. The deep cut on his left thigh had already been healed. A chunk the size of a walnut was missing from his right calf. He wondered what it would be like walking. The lacerations and punctures in his chest and belly had been closed by skillful hands, but they all felt like they might open at the slightest movement. He was like an overstuffed ragdoll fit to burst at the seams. Apparently the spiderweb scar on his back had been joined by a long divot and red burns crawled root-like across his flesh. His broken fingers had been set and bound but not magically mended. The many smaller cuts and bruises as well as much of the burns had been conventionally bandaged and stitched, leaving him with enough wrapping to make his nudity an afterthought. He sat in only a loincloth 
unperturbed as Ayala walked back in, holding several small vials. She was wearing brown riding trousers and a loose green shirt. Gold embroidery danced along the back and around the drawstring collar. And, in typical Ayala fashion, it appeared the sleeves had met with a violent end. Danica says the burns are the biggest issue. She gave them once over, but it will take time. And she needs to focus on Bracknell right now. The hunter blinked and looked up at her with big eyes. Yeah, Brack's alive. He's in the other room. He... <sighs> she cut herself off and swallowed, looking away. He hasn't woken up yet. She placed the vials on the end table and sat in a chair across from him. You, uh, on the other hand, have woken up a couple times. You took water, even a bit of stew. So you're stuck with me. The hunter looked at her quizzically. You don't remember, do you? He shook his head. <sighs> Figures. Well, I might as well fill you in. She crossed one leg over the other and dove into the facts. You are in the Sleeping Giant. You've been here for two days. It's the 29th of Second Seed. Two nights ago, I could hardly sleep with all the howls and other sounds coming from the mountains. So I was out and about when a rider arrived shouting for Danica and more soldiers. I guess Brack had sent word about a necromancer and some huge monster about to attack the town. I tagged along with the priestess, and when we got here, Delphine was quite overwhelmed. You and Brack had gotten the worst of it, but the guards wanted their people healed first. They were yapping on and on about some guy called Gloston, who I guess killed the monster and saved the village. She steepled her index fingers and pressed them to her lips as she searched for more details. You were nearly clapped in irons. They found the monster, but there was no sign of a necromancer, so I guess some of them looked at you and filled in the blank. Delphine vouched for you, along with this wood elf and a blacksmith. Once I arrived, though, I put that to bed for a bit. You woke up midday yesterday when this guard captain wanted to interrogate you. That was about as unproductive as you can imagine. Probably more so once I found out about it. Then you woke up last night for a bit and we were able to feed you. And now, you need to drink this. Ayala grabbed a suspiciously green vial and held it out to him. For the burns, I guess. The hunter looked at his bandaged hand, rubbing his stump unconsciously. He tried to speak, but between disuse, damage, and sobbing, his voice didn't respond. Ayla's brows furrowed and she leaned forward. What was that? The hunter tried again, managing a soft squeak. Ayla stood and stepped closer. She leaned down so her forehead was nearly resting on his shoulder. He felt the brush of her hair over his new scar. What is it? She asked. You? The hunter rasped. You should be with him. Ayala snapped up, spun on the balls of her feet, and slumped back into her seat. A metallic blue eye sharply met his from behind her auburn locks. Just for a moment, he saw that eye flash red. Self-pity doesn't look good on you, stranger. She bit off the words with a harsh snap. Then something in her tone softened. There's nothing I can do for him. Crimson still flickered behind her gaze. But I can help you. Or try, at least. So I will. Just... <sighs> Tell me what you want, damn it, and drink this green goop. The hunter nodded slowly and sipped the potion, coughing at the taste and wincing at the cough. Who else got hurt? He asked weakly. Well, there was one guard who broke his arm and one who got cut up. I know she's fine. Just yesterday, they lost one, though. The hunter started. How? They went back to ransack the cabin, and one of them picked up this knife and accidentally cut himself with it. I guess the knife was poisoned. He was dead by the time I saw him. Veins all black and bulging. Part of why they were so eager to pin this all on you. Nasty business. It is. The hunter agreed. Why'd they go back? I guess they were looking for evidence... Found a stone basement with a bunch of necromantic stuff. They took everything they could carry. What about the sword? Ayala sat back. Right! The guards confiscated that, along with all your stuff. I think they wanted to use it as evidence against you or something. They stored it with all the necromancer stuff. It's Bracknell's, right? I remember him talking about it. Yeah. 
We should go get it. I found an empty scabbard among his effects. Can you walk? One way to find out. The hunter said, shifting and seizing. Everything stung. Hey, can you get me something? Clothes? No. You know, you're going to have to get used to them eventually. Your furs are scrapped, no repairing those. It'd just be pure twine at that point. <laughs> the hunter gave a wincing laugh and shook his head. A mirror. Ayla froze. I know it feels bad, but I just want to see how bad it looks. Ayla measured him for a moment. There was something in those eyes he didn't recognize. I'll be right back, she said, standing and leaving the room in one quick motion. The hunter was a bit taken aback by her abruptness, but wasn't actually surprised until she returned carrying a sloshing bucket of water. I don't need to poop yet, if that's what you're thinking. I didn't eat much while I was out there. Do you think you can come sit in this chair, or do you need help? Um... The hunter began, still confused. I guess I could use a hand getting up. Ayla helped him into the chair and placed the bucket next to him. You're probably still sensitive on the side here, but I'm going to touch your head, is that okay? I... uh... suppose. He flinched when the cool water trickled across his burns, but didn't stop her, as she softly kneaded, brushed, and massaged. It was rhythmic and soothing. His eyelids grew heavy, and he found himself leaning into the contact. Soon, his head was thoroughly damp. I'm going to take out my knife now, so don't... Just... Do you think you can stay calm? The hunter nodded softly. I think so. Ayala drew her knife and took a clump of hair between her fingers. With a swift motion, she cut it. The hunter was going to ask if this was part of some ritual before she repeated the action, and he realized what was happening. He held his tongue, resigning himself to her whim once more. She cut the length and most of the scraggle out of his hair, then began to absolutely shear the left side. It was almost a shave with how close she was getting. At one point, she moved in front of him, almost straddling him as she worked. He couldn't help but notice that the laces at her collar were loose and he had a clear view of her chest. Um, Ayala? Yeah? I can see down your shirt. The Nord woman laughed. <laughs> Stare all you want for all the good it'll do you. The hunter grinned and closed his eyes. Hey, Ayala? Mm-hmm. I know we haven't actually known each other long, but... I missed you. He felt her free hand snake around the back of his neck and her soft lips press against his forehead. I missed you too, she said in a voice more tender than he'd ever heard her use. Then she continued her work. You gave me a damn heart attack. I hope you know I'm going to kick your ass for that once you get better. Both of you. Looking forward to it. <laughs> now you see that there? That isn't normal. Oh, shut it. You smell like a wet dog. Wow. Did you really? I did. The hunter smiled mischievously. Can't kick my ass till I get better, right? You sure you want to run up a tab? I can do more than rough you up, you know. Like what? Ayala reached for the two remaining vials. I can tell you it's time for you to drink both of these. Oh, here scenes Grundle. The hunter cursed. What for? Blood loss. Damn it. The hunter tried to down the first one as quickly as possible. Would it kill them to add a little honey to these? No, but it might kill you. Would it? I don't know, I'm not an alchemist. Besides, what do you need honey for when I'm right here? The hunter froze and looked at her like she'd just sprouted an extra limb. The wolf of Whiterun held his gaze for a moment, then broke into a guffaw. Sure, bones, he exclaimed. <laughs> your face, she cackled. That was scary. Save that for your enemies. Oh man, I wish I had a painting of that. That's the scariest thing I've ever seen you do, and I know what I'm talking about. Hey, keep talking like this and I might think you're all healed up. I'm just a simple huntress after all. I might get confused. Simple my ass. <laughs> he grinned as Ayala leaned her head on his and the pair descended into a fit of giggling. 
Once they had composed themselves, she finished by shaving his wiry beard, leaving only a wispy mustache and goatee. When she finally brought him a mirror, he saw what she had done. The burns on the right side of his face were bad. They were angry, scabbed in places, and he could tell that even once they healed, there would be very little hair growing in that area. However, with the other side shortened to match, it almost looked normal. The most abnormal thing about it was the sight of his face. He hadn't seen his face for ages, not since he had taken up residence under that mop. A thick band of hair now ran along the top of his head. All the unruliness that had made it a disaster while long now gave it a pleasant, windswept, relaxed appearance. He knitted his eyebrows and turned his head this way and that. He didn't look at all deformed. He didn't look grizzled or haggard or lopsided. He just looked... What do you think? Ayla asked. It's... um... The hunter was still stunned from seeing his face. It's... different. He tried to smile, then noticed that the right side of his mouth moved much less than the left. The burns had dulled the nerves and stiffened the skin, giving him a strange, cockeyed grin. It is, Ayala said pointedly, turning him to face her. And that's all it is. It's different. Ayala never asked the hunter what exactly happened on the mountain. He supposed that to her the story was self-evident. There was a necromancer and a monster, now there wasn't, and the hunter sat there with enough battle scars to last several lifetimes. Open and shut. He also wondered if, being a warrior herself, she knew that he was having difficulty making sense of events, let alone putting them into words. It wasn't easy getting the hunter into the spare pair of trousers and woolen shirt. He was stiff everywhere that should have been flexible and tender everywhere that should have been firm. It was near impossible to get him into the pair of shoes. He had to be thoroughly convinced that his shredded boots were no longer fit for travel. Only once he saw that the right one's toe was being held on by a strip of leather as thin as a bowstring did he relent and the pair could get moving off towards the guard barracks on the south side of town. Set just inside the cobblestone wall along the town border was a sprawling, one-story building. It had several ways of ingress that opened onto various paths or up onto the outer wall itself. Only one of the doors had a guard actually stationed at it, but his calm, approachable posture and good vantage point seemed to make it clear that to attempt to enter by any other door would be considered very rude. The light burned more than he felt it should as he staggered out into the day. All the same, his burnt lungs were elated to breathe the crisp, clean air of the afternoon. The breeze cooled his burns, carried fragrant leaves past his nose, and the tree's gentle song past his ear. It caressed his neck and chilled him wonderfully as though he were breaching the water. As they made their way slowly and gingerly through the town, the hunters saw many familiar faces stop and take notice. Alvor looked up from his forge and offered him a bright smile and a wave. Feindal offered a quick smile and a nod from over the top of the high stack of lumber in his arms. Sven scowled at him from a porch where he sat next to an elderly woman whose expression appeared pointedly absent. The hunter also noticed that the guard presence had substantially increased. The town was littered with gold sashes, and many of them seemed to take notice and be drawn into orbit as the odd pair approached the barracks. The guards sitting by the door stood as they approached. A thick, husky Nord man with a set of thin whiskers that betrayed his youth. Well met, citizen, he greeted. We beg your pardon, but the barracks are off limits while the investigation is ongoing. I do not come to hinder your investigation, Ayala said, but to aid it. We have everything we need to do our jobs. You have much more than what you need from what I hear. We are here to clarify. And to reclaim. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I have my orders. 
This is the business of the White Run Guard, not of you. Ayala clicked her tongue. It's good to know that the Guard is taking its duties seriously, but I was not aware that those duties included stealing from the fabled Hall of the Companions. The young guardsman blanched and started as if seeing her for the first time. I, I apologize, Madam Huntress. I didn't recognize you with, um... Without the face paint, the armor, and the blood, she finished. Don't worry about it. Just let us in and all will be forgotten. To the kid's immense credit, he didn't cave immediately. However, his eyes were darting furtively all around, clearly uncomfortable being caught between his orders and one of the most respected figures in the hold. Why don't you take it up with the captain and get his thoughts on the matter? I will. The guard nodded. Thank you, ma'am. He disappeared inside. Ayala turned back to the hunter and whispered, No one can make you say anything. Just leave this to me. The hunter nodded, and a few moments later the kid reappeared, followed by an older man with thick arms, a captain's insignia on his sash, and a wide belly that was just noticeable under his uniform. Hail, companion, he said with a smile. It slid once he recognized the hunter. I hope this isn't going to be a continuation of our last meeting. Not unless you make it so. We are here to collect that which was wrongfully taken. My cohort's effects along with an enchanted blade of ice and blizzards. Those items are currently part of an investigation. They are not yours to take. They belong to the companions. They are not yours to keep. I could say the same about your friend here. And here we go again. After hearing testimony from some of the townspeople and the priestess of Kinareth, we've just about ruled your associate out as a suspect. Well, it's good to know that you're making some use of those empty buckets on your shoulders. The captain wore the smile of a man exercising patience. However, unlike yesterday, he seems to have his wits about him. Why shouldn't he help us fill in the gaps? He defeated the necromancer, the same one who summoned that monster and would have raised this village to the ground. He deserves your respect, not your suspicion. We understand that the shack belonged to... A frail old woman. We did find evidence that this necromancer harbored dreadful ambitions as you describe, yet we have not found her nor her body. Can your friend perhaps point us in the right direction? Provide some basis for his heroics other than his wounds? The hunter thought briefly of the thousands of far-flung ice crystals that had once been a niece. No, the hunter said flatly. I could not. He noticed the almost imperceptible tensing in Ayella's shoulders. I killed her, but there is no body to show. The captain nodded, focusing on him for the first time. Then it is only the good word of your acquaintances that can keep minds from drifting. Ayella crossed her arms, eyes flashing death. And pray where exactly are these minds drifting to? He could have been an accomplice. He could have spirited her away or turned against her at the first sign of trouble. He might even be her in another form. Necromancers are notorious for their prowess with illusions. I should have known. Ayala shook her head. You hear one good ghost story and off you go chasing phantoms. Where is the body? It's a very simple question. The weapon I used and you took left no remains. Sounds more like the work of a battle mage than any weapon. No mere enchantment is so destructive as to leave nothing. I am no mage. Then prove it! How could I? shouted the hunter, growing agitated. Show us that this weapon has the power you claim. Are you sure you want that? A hand suddenly alighted on the hunter's freshly healed shoulder. He flinched, expecting pain, but the touch was gentle as a feather. He turned to see Ayala looking at him. Her eyes were calm, but fierce. He could see the wolf in her baring its teeth. In an instant, the look was gone, and she smiled at the captain confidently. Take us to this sword, she said evenly, and you will have your proof. The captain eyed them both suspiciously for a moment, before huffing. You leave your weapons outside. Sir, we carry no weapons. Ayala gestured to the empty scabbard at her belt. We have not come to quarrel. The hunter tried not to crack a smile at the thought of how redundant a weapon would be, if Ayala actually did want to hurt these guards. 
The building's dim interior was defined by a long central hallway that opened to several side rooms with a larger room at the back. The captain led them down to where two guards were chatting it up outside a closed door. As they approached, one was sitting and one was leaning against the wall, but both stood when they saw the captain. What's going on, sir? One said, an imperial woman with hair tied into a light brown bun. Open the storage room. We're trying to settle something. The other was squinting at the hunter and Ayala. Say, isn't that open the door? The captain cut him off. Right away, sir. The woman pulled out a set of keys and, selecting one, slid it into the keyhole. What followed was an awkward moment of quiet as the guard tried unsuccessfully to unlock the door. She twisted and wiggled, pulled and reinserted the key, all to no effect. Is that the right key? Of course it is. Do you need a hand? Lay off, the guard said, clearly frustrated. She clenched her teeth and strained. I can do this myself. On that last word, there was an audible pop, and the key turned. Did you just break it? The captain asked. No, look, the guard said, gently removing the conspicuously intact key from the lock. The captain raised an eyebrow as the other guard reached for the latch. It also turned with an odd crunch. He tested the door, and when it wouldn't open, he put his shoulder into it. The first hit, bearing no fruit, he tried again, harder this time. With a crunch and a creak, a wash of chilled air spread down the hallway. Even the hard-skinned Nords present squinted at the rush of frost. When they peeked into the room, they saw that the whole interior was lined with a thin layer of ice crystals. Every wall, book, chest, rack, crate, and table was frosted over with bright prisms of ice. Sharp frost spikes crunched under the feet of the astonished captain as he entered. Sitting on a table in the middle of the room next to a fur pack, bow, and quiver was the sword. Ayala smiled, unbuckled the empty scabbard at her hip, and handed it to the hunter. As the captain turned around to berate his guards for their inattentiveness and apologize to Ayala, the hunter stepped into the room. His burns lit up in the cold, his head and ears suddenly unprotected without his shaggy mane of hair. The room was dark and oddly beautiful as if he stepped into a cave crusted with diamonds. Though the voices outside still chattered away, the world in here seemed to slow down as he approached the sword. It was such an alien thing. The hilt seemed Nibbanese, not unlike the blades of the legionnaires, yet this was intricate. Its idiosyncrasies had been built into its making ages ago, not added after the fact to a mass-produced hunk of military steel. The material looked like gold, but couldn't have been. It had been too light and maneuverable in his grip. And the blade. It was ice. He couldn't think of any other way to describe it. It was ice stolen from the black heart of a glacier. Now finally exposed to the world, it seemed determined to shine like a star. The sound of rushing wind grew louder as he moved closer, and for a moment he feared that he was slipping into a dream. He grabbed it, and it came with no hassle nor fuss as he slid it into the scabbard. In the wake of this anticlimax, the hunter placed a hand on his deflated pack looked at his old bow, Laria, and sighed. As he did, his eye drifted down to the end of the table. Several crates sat there, full of books and odd tools, the function of which he could only guess at. He spotted a pestle and mortar, something he was familiar with from he and Bracknell's forays into alchemy. This must be the necromancer's workshop, all packed away and caked with ice. Sitting to the side of an odd basin, he spotted a book, it was unlike the other books he saw. They all had labels. Some looked like titles he might find in a store. But this one was small, unmarked, bound up in leather. Curiosity drew him to it. But he suddenly remembered where he was standing. It was at about that moment that the captain was, in so many words, asking if there was a way he could help them get this absurd thing out of his lovely building. The hunter turned slightly, eyes still trained on the book. A blanket. Or a cloak, perhaps. It's rather difficult to handle. I'd like to wrap it up if I could.
It took Danica Pearspring several moments to recognize the odd shaved-headed man in ill-fitting clothes shambling along, leaning on Ayala. But once she did, she was incensed. The hunter learned on that day beyond any doubt that the fiery temper and supernatural strength of the Wolf of Whiterun was nothing compared to a pissed-off priestess of Kinnereth. He found himself being almost thrown into his bed, a fresh wave of salves and potions being thrust into his arms with enough force to send him through the wall. Bracknell still hadn't woken up. He knew this, for as he was being herded to his bed, he steered himself away just enough to poke his head into the room next to his. His friend lay back, bound up in sheets and furs. His head was bandaged, and his mouth was agape, frozen somewhere between a cry and a moan. He was old. The hunter had always known it, but never seen it under the man's lively spirit. Now his features all sunk back into the valleys of his bones. A single rattling breath was all he heard before being wrenched away. What's wrong with him? He asked the priestess. His body has been broken, yet the spirit lingers. What can we do? The best thing you can do for him is to be no concern of mine. Now get in there and rest, confounded fool thinking he's fit to wander on one leg. I ought to hang you up by your toenails. Even if the hunter had the time to respond, he doubted he could have thought of anything to answer that. Ayala was reluctant to leave the hunter's side, but the, albeit successful confrontation with the guards and subsequent rimming from Danica, had left her with an ache in her bones for violent activity and explosive movement. After multiple assurances that he would take his medicines, the hunter talked her into going out for a run around the forest, and perhaps practicing her archery, out where the wolves watched and laughed. So it was, as the light outside grew to a warm amber and dimmed to violet, he found himself alone. Patrons had begun to trickle into the tavern. A group of traveling musicians stopped in asking if they could play for meals and beds, the burns on the side of his head were starting to feel much better under Danica's salve. He walked to the wall that separated he and Bracknell's rooms and leaned his forehead against it. He missed the woods. It had taken so little time for it to happen, but he was already so tired of civilization. He missed his isolated little camp outside Helgen. Out there, concerned only with the coming and going of seasons, of game, of rain and snow. Out there he could be alone without being lonely. But in here he felt profoundly how separated he was from the smiling faces and chatting voices just through these wooden barriers. How could he ever explain to any of them what had happened on that mountain? Some of them had caught the ending, the dregs, the ashes of the last few days. The only person who had some inkling was unconscious in the next room, likely taking his last breaths. While the mission was there, while the threat was present, every action followed the next, all necessary, all aiming towards some goal. And now as he sat, left alone to count the cost of it all, he felt the void left by the necromancer as an open wound. He felt it in his injured friend, in the promise he failed to keep. Promise you'll look after Bracknell, Delphine had said. How he ever did try. He felt it in the mountain. The hundreds of hermits and hunters, the bandits and travelers, the city of people he'd seen reflected in that dead army. No one would know them, or how they were lost. No one would know the sight they were spared. The fate. The long roads stretched from Falkreath in the south, Markarth to the east, and Whiterun, the middlemost hold of Skyrim. The roads formed a triangle, the Bleak Falls Mountains lost in the middle, jumbled in with a maze of seldom-walked paths and seldom-seen vistas. Finally, he felt that void in the fleeting but concrete purpose the necromancer had given him. What would he do now? Bracknell had a footlocker he needed to pick up. He himself had an order for a sword with Yorland Greymane, and now he would need a new finger. Yet another thing he owed Ayala for. Why had he come by this road? 
Circumstance at first, then the search for power? The power to be free from the whims of fate, to be at peace, and it only brought him more conflict. With the strength came that question, what would he do? What a mercy to be anonymous. Perhaps if his paltry strength were known, the world would only reach out to challenge it. The troubles of others would continue to become his own. The boulder he dropped on the head of the beast was evidence enough that even the mountains themselves could not sleep undisturbed. Was it foolish then? Power for peace? Perhaps the best he could do was hope to be ignored. Perhaps there was nothing to do. The power he held was so small. He saw that in so many ways, but even in that modesty, he understood that power needed some direction, some purpose. He'd seen power for its own sake. He'd seen her face. He looked to the cupboard, where he'd stored the bundled sword. He stepped over and, hands flinching at the cold, extracted the book from the mess of cloth. He lit a candle not to read the book, but to thaw it. It was a slow process, and he was glad that no one walked in while he was doing it. Once he was pretty sure the pages wouldn't shatter like glass, he cautiously untied the leather bands and opened it. He did not open to the first page. Rather, he deftly thumbed the pages, letting them flutter, stiffly at first, then fluidly. He let the book flop from back to front for a moment before suddenly a page came loose at the back. The book wasn't right next to the candle, but he reflexively snatched it away all the same. Slowly, opening to the back cover, he found a folded slip of parchment tucked in between the paper and leather. It had been hidden there. It felt like he'd just uncovered a startled mole while digging a latrine. He took the paper, unfolding it, and in that mixed light, beheld a letter. The hand was slanted and ornate, a bit gaudy, really. It read, Helgi, dear, why do you hesitate? You can feel the power coursing in your blood. Renounce that boy of yours and come, come live with me in the forest. My sisters will be here soon. Together, we can form a proper coven and your training will truly begin. Helgi. The hunter mulled the name over in his head. It didn't find a match. Could she be another necromancer? The thought turned his stomach and fluttered his heart. Were there more? Was there more carnage waiting in the woods? Was something stirring? Was Helgen safe? What about Falkreath? He hadn't heard news from them in ages. A thought tickled the back of his mind, and he read the letter again. Why do you hesitate? It read. This person, Helgi, may have the gift, as Anise said, but had not sought to use it. What should he be then? A preemptive executioner for the magically sensitive? Nonsense. That would be asinine. The mention of the sisters, however, was troubling. Very troubling, actually, yet, as could be expected, maddeningly unhelpful. He sighed and lifted the letter to the candle flame. No one else needed to die. The thought was as much a wish as it was an assessment. The parchment sparked, smoked, and smoldered. He held on for as long as he could, letting the fire eat all the way to the corner. In those dancing flames, he swore he saw her standing before her burning home. Returning his attention to the book, he began flitting through the pages, skimming the words and drawings he found there. The writing was hasty and careless, highlighting how the elegant scrawl of the letter had been for show. There were names he didn't recognize, some pages were dated, some weren't. Much of it was text, detailing minor victories and setbacks. Knowing what victory had looked like to Anise, he was tempted not to read further. But in some places the text fell away, replaced by diagrams and lists. There were drawings and instructions. These were necromantic spells and rituals. There were recipes for potions, and experimental accounts of the effects certain concoctions had on the body. There was real alchemical knowledge here. Sure, much of it was extremely unsavory in nature, but the insights were legitimate. He went very quickly from holding the journal at arm's length to poring over it, wishing he had a journal of his own to jot down the relevant details. As he combed the pages, he flitted ahead to see how far the journal went. The back fourth appeared empty. 
Then, at the very back, he found the writing started again, only flipped upside down. He turned the book and realized that the hand had changed. This was the journal of someone named Irgri. Words that jumped out at him hinted at a young, optimistic mind, excited for new horizons. She had taken this journal off someone, flipped it, and made it her own. Struck by the macabre poetry of that, he began flitting back to where he had been, only to pause. In the middle of all these busy pages, a nearly blank one flew by. It wasn't just a page or two. An entire fold was blank, but for a single phrase, scrawled in that elegant hand across both pages. A dream is only a dream. The hunter said the words aloud, hearing them echo back off the walls. Was that melancholy? Had she just lost hope? He turned the page. The next fold was back to the norm, including an intricate rune circle on the right. The next page was more of the same, and he was about to move on when he noticed the phrase repeated. Not in the text, but in the margin. The words crawled vertically up the side of the page, a dream is only a dream, and just a dream, just a dream. He turned the page again. There they were, twice this time, between the lines. On the next page, they were the lines. Those words were all over this fold, in all styles and sizes, overlapping and filling the space out to the edges. She had written this hundreds of times, and not all at once, as if whenever she needed to, she would come back to this page and get it out. This was not mourning, this was not despair, this was a mantra. She was repeating this to herself again and again as if to focus her, keep her sane. As if she was running from a thought. Fearful of a notion, of a dream. He quickly flipped back to the page that was almost blank and went one page previous. The fold was black, completely black, but for a pair of red circles he was sure were made with blood. Next page, more blackness, but now it had some shape. The red turned out to be eyes set into a jagged horned head. Next page, he saw mountains, a refined sketch of a landscape, the sky blotted out by a black-winged, red-eyed monstrosity. It sprung out from the peak of the mountain like a geyser of East March. It shadowed the land like a thunderstorm, blanketing day and night, blotting out sun, moons, and stars alike. Terrible jaws opened, it writhed like a serpent, and turned that gaze onto him. He snapped the book shut with an audible clap. Twilight came and went. The sleeping giant gradually filled up with patrons, all weary from a day's toil but buzzing with excitement over the traveling band of musicians. The drama of the past few days only added to the nervous energy. The hunter could smell it. Revelry was in the air. Ayella returned from blowing off steam and issued the hunter a glare capable of cutting glass when she saw that one of his potions hadn't been drunk. He promptly downed it with a well-practiced gulp. Danica, it seemed, was still in Bracknell's room, so the pair snuck out like children to sit by the bar and watch the tavern fill up. The hunter tore through a chicken breast and some egg and butter fried bread. The food soothed both that deep hunger of the ordeal and the queasiness from the medicine cocktail. He was eating so fast that Ayella had to pull the food out of his reach, only giving it back to him once he promised to chew. He washed down his meal with a mug of water, while Ayella was quick to order a stein of mead. I swear, keeping you out of trouble is going to kill me one day. Who says you have to? Shut up and eat. How's life in Whiterun? The hunter asked. It's busy as always. Ayala carefully sipped off the top of her frothing drink. <clears throat> the Empire sent an emissary to the Arl, offering aid and protection against the Stormcloaks to the east. He didn't look happy when he left, so I think we're still neutral. Uh, Vilkus, Galdus, and Dramasha went out to scout the Valtime Towers. 
they got ambushed, and we lost Ramasha. The hunter looked at her, concern evident. I'm sorry to hear that. Ayla nodded, taking a drink. Comes with the territory. I'm sorry for the bandits myself. The hunter scrunched up his face at that. I don't follow. At first this was business. Now it's personal. Her eyes flared crimson in a way that had nothing to do with the fire pit. They won't last long. The hunter nodded. I feel bad for them too. He sipped his drink. Were you close to her? No, Ayla replied grimly. Not really. I mean, we... Well, not really. She sniffed hard and wrapped her knuckles on his arm. <sighs> Speaking of Whiterun, though, I've got an update on your sword. It's done? Quite the opposite. Yorland Greymane is on something of a hiatus. Why is that? His son, Thorold's gone missing. Presumed dead. You're serious? Why would I joke about that? Point. Why is he presumed dead? Because the Grey Manes support the Stormcloak Rebellion, and the two eldest sons went off to join the fight. Now, Thorold's missing. The Battleborns have been absolutely insufferable about it. The rich family with the farm. Yeah, they're fierce supporters of the Empire. Since the news came, they've been hounding the Grey Manes, shaming, ridiculing, and taunting them, saying things I hesitate to repeat. A city divided, then. Honestly, folks don't really know what to make of it all just yet. But those two families hold a lot of sway. They were among the founders of the city generations back. Now, not even a son's death is sacred. That's... The hunter looked for the right words. Uh, fucking horrible. Ayla let out a snort of laughter. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> fucking horrible. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah. We've been getting a lot of travelers as well. I'd expect as much. It's Whiterun. There were some merchants from Morrowind who came down from Dawnstar. Farngar was practically sprinting to get some Netch Jelly. He had a new assistant, um, a white-haired girl with a tail. A tail? You, you mean like a Khajiit? Yeah, I think she's some half-breed like you. But a tail? How can that be? The cat folk come in all manner of forms. I heard their shape is determined at birth by the phases of the moon. I actually ran into some the other day. Khajiit? Ayela sipped her drink. Mm hmm. Outside the walls? Of course. They had a good deal on a Cyrodiilic buckler. Telos knows where they got it. <laughs> Funny. Good find, I guess. The companions are always on the lookout for artifacts of Yskrimor, so we stumble into good equipment regularly. Oh, I got an elvish bow not too long ago? Haven't broken it in yet, saving that for a rainy day. Speaking of which, you ever stumble into those giants of yours? Hmm, no actually. They've been avoiding the farms. You mean they've been avoiding you? He offered her a lopsided grin. Ayala raised an eyebrow from behind her stein. Hmm, flattery, the bane of the stoic and honorable. Shall I stop? I never said that. It was about that time that Orgnar drifted over to them. Sure you won't have an ale? He asked the hunter flatly. No thanks, he said, tapping his mug with his finger. He won't be drinking at all tonight, Ayla said, leaning in. He's still recovering from saving the entire hold. Hmm, grunted Orgnar, barely listening as he moved off down the bar. Ayla scowled after him, but the hunter placed a hand on her shoulder and shook his head. Heroes can afford clothes that fit. Heroes deserve a stiff drink, she answered, clinking her cup to his. I pity you. It's probably for the best. I seem to make a lot of mistakes when I drink. Hmm, mistakes, huh? Ayla took a swig. The fun kind? The fun kind? The hunter echoed, unsure what she was getting at. Then it clicked. Oh. 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 No. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, not me. Not lately. He took a sip. I make the kind of mistakes that get me kicked out of places like this. Right. Ayla nodded. I think I heard about that. From who? From Brack. Oh, the hunter said. 
feeling the air around them go cold. That makes sense. Ayala looked away and took a very long draft. He swirled his water awkwardly and cleared his throat. <clears throat> I don't think tonight's a good night for mistakes anyway. He lifted up his shirt, showing off his extensive bandaging. I fear I'll spring a hundred leaks. Ayala's eyes darkened at the sight, and the humor in the hunter's voice seemed to slide off her. Are you okay? The hunter almost laughed. <laughs> I mean... No. He gestured to himself and then back to the room where Bracknell lay. Between this and that, I'm not okay at all. But that's fine. That, that's just... That's what it is. How about you? What? Are you okay? Of course I'm okay. Why the fuck wouldn't I be okay? I was just thinking... Well, don't. Hmm? You'll just get hurt again. Fine. You're okay. Better than okay, even. That's right. Ayla nodded. And the gods damned Wolf of Whiterun. The hunter sipped his water pensively. Is that all you are, then? Ayela went very still. After a moment, the hunter felt a growl rumbling through the bar. He was sure he'd just signed his own death warrant until the rattle died and Ayela took another swig. I thought you said you weren't in a state to make mistakes. Well, he sighed. Not the fun kind. Suddenly, Ayala grinned a dangerous grin. So then we do the next best thing. That being... Here. Turning and leaning back, elbows on the bar, Ayala crossed her legs and stared easily out at the growing crowd. The hunter turned with her and looked out. What? Now tell me, who in this tavern would you want to make a mistake with? The hunter was taken aback. He felt his exposed face flush with reserves of blood he didn't know he had. Really? Yeah, come on, it's fun. No. I'll do it too. I'm not playing this game. Why not? Ayala asked. Like you said, it's a game. The hunter drank the water as if it would give him courage. Okay, fine. He scanned around the room. Delphine was getting the fire going. If Bracknell didn't pull through, he didn't suspect he'd ever be able to look her in the face. The sleeping giant would likely be lost to him as well. Shaking the thought from his head, he continued searching. Camilla's raven hair was tied up in loops. She was sitting to the right with Feindal, who was miming the drawing of a bow, no doubt in the middle of an animated recounting of the battle. Over to the far end of the room, Sven was helping the band set up, all the while seeming decidedly morose and shooting glances over at the pair. Finally, he settled on someone a little less complicated. Ginger hair, elegant but strong features. Sigrid, he said. I don't really know these people. Who's Sigrid? Over there with the reddish hair. Oh, next to the blacksmith. That's Alvor. She's his wife, actually. Ayela turned back to him in mock astonishment. You have a thing for the blacksmith's wife? Oh, shut up. You asked. Stranger, I am shocked and appalled. The hunter tried to elbow her in the ribs, but of course she blocked it without batting an eye. Sometimes trying to get a hit on her felt like trying to push a log up the White River. Such constant and effortless resistance. What would the people of this fine town think if they knew they had such a home wrecker in their midst? I'm not going to do anything about it. Of course not. Look at her husband. The hunter buried his face in his hands, now going really red. That's not... <sighs> Skies, why did I even start? The smithy's wife, Ayla repeated. It's worthy of a novel, isn't it? Say, you ever read The Lusty Argonian? Okay, okay, who would you make a mistake with? Oh, that's easy. Ayla's grin carried the moon's glow. The smithy's wife. The hunter stared at her, bewildered for a moment. Before laughing hard enough, he thought he might literally bust a gut. Ayala leaned against him, cackling so violently her stein would have been sloshing all over the floor if it wasn't already half empty. <laughs> Listen, the hunter wheezed. I might be a vagrant, a vagabond, a wastrel, a wanderer, a hooligan, a scoundrel. Okay, watch it, the hunter said, waving his hand as if to sweep the rapid exchange into the past. The point is... 
I can be a home wrecker. But you? A noble warrior of Yskrimor's companions? <laughs> Ayala took a drink, reducing the cackles to giggles. What can I say? You have good taste. She's so pretty, isn't she? She's gorgeous! The companion was smiling bright and very flushed. Are you blushing? I guess so. The wolf of Whiterun is blushing. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Ayala tapped him rapidly on the shoulder. Do another one. Never thought I'd see the day. Quickly! Fuck. <laughs> okay, um... The hunter placed a hand on his forehead and looked out at the crowd. Mill workers, local farmers, smiths and merchants filled the main room. But much like the town, the most notable presence was that of the guards. He'd only ever seen three at a time here in Riverwood, but there were at least twelve, maybe fifteen milling around now. Sifting through the gold sashes, he settled on an imperial woman with colovian features, a button nose, and light brown hair pulled back into a tousled tail. Her, he said, pointing the woman out. Ayla nodded. That's the guard from earlier. Yep. <laughs> were you just taken by how she unlocked a door? Yep. Really? She seemed kind of headstrong, determined, that kind of thing. Eh, a little pissy if you ask me. Okay, what's yours? The captain. Really? Absolutely. Didn't you nearly shout him into an early grave? Yeah, and he didn't try to run next time he saw me. He even tried to argue again, I can respect that. The hunter put his fingers to his temples and gestured to the man. You'd really want to make a mistake with that? She bent her neck to the side, popping it. I'd live. Yeah, you'd live, of course. How about one more? I knew you'd like this game. It's certainly diverting, he said, scanning the room for a pretty face. Barman, another mead! Ayala called, lifting an empty stein. The hunter mimicked her. And I'll have another... fucking... water. Of the musicians setting up in the corner, the Nord at the head was tuning up his lute. Oddly enough, a large awesomer woman, an orc, was laying out a series of drums. A wiry Breton was cleaning his flute, and next to him, rosining the bow of her fiddle, was a diminutive Bosmer. There, the Bosmer in the band, he said. A wood elf. Hmm. Ayala huffed, scratching her chin. What was that sound? She's just kind of small. So? I always thought you liked women who can kick your ass. In my state, a stiff breeze could kick my ass. Who's to say she couldn't? Ayala jabbed a finger at him. See, I knew it! You admit it! He jabbed a finger back at her as if they were fencing. I admitted nothing. Besides, you like people who argue with you. He twirled his finger like a sword and poked her in the ribs, <laughs> earning a giggle. At least I can be honest with myself, she said, poking him back. So why do you like her? I've never met her, I just think she's cute. Orgnar brought their drinks and the pair snatched them up. Cheers, Ayla said. Cheers. And the two drank. So you don't know anything about her, Ayla began, now audibly slurring. What can you infer about her? Um... The hunter looked back at the wood elf. She likes music? Incredible, Ayla said, voice dripping with sarcasm. You ever hear that Bosmer eat their dead? See, I've heard that. But I don't think that's true. It is true. No, it sounds like one of those Nord idioms. Dunmer sneeze ash, Khajiit make good rugs. How many mages does it take to light a candle? How many? Ten. One to light it and nine to put out the house fire next door. Ayala chuckled. <laughs> that's good. I like that. But the Bosmer one I happen to know is true. You've seen it? No, but I know a guy. The hunter raised a skeptical eyebrow. You know a guy. I know a guy who saw it firsthand. Fine, the hunter said, spreading his fingers. You know, after what I've seen this week, eating the dead doesn't sound so bad to me. Leave nothing left, I say. By the sky, it's damn economical. Ayala had turned back to the room and was taking in the musician the way one examines a fine tapestry. She tapped the hunter's arm, prompting him to turn as well. You know what? She began. I think I can offer a little more insight. That being? I think she'd appreciate it. Ayala leaned into him and whispered, If you brought some rope, 
The fuck? The hunter recoiled, staring incredulous at the wolf of Whiterun, who for her part, burst into helpless laughter. He looked around the tavern as if someone was going to help him with this madwoman. Then he smiled wide. Where is this depravity coming from? Stranger, she gasped. Your face is such a treat. <laughs> That's stupid, the hunter said emphatically as Ayla tried to compose herself. That's so stupid. I mean, obviously. And with that, the two of them were gone for almost a minute. Of all the conversations he could be having with one of the most respected warriors of the hold, this was not one he could have foreseen. <laughs> oh, your breath smells like mead, he eventually said, still loopy. And you smell like someone who's been lying in bed for two days straight. Take a bath, you mongrel. <laughs> Sounds about right. The hunter looked out at the room once more. Who's your third? He asked. Only Ayala was no longer next to him. He looked around and spotted her halfway across the room, making a beeline for the group of musicians. No. He breathed in disbelief as Ayala started speaking to the Bosmer woman. No. He repeated when she turned and pointed at him. He felt himself blush and buried his face in his hands. Is there a problem? Asked Orgnar, sidling over. The hunter gave him a wide-eyed look of terror. That woman is going to ruin my life. Orgnar looked from him to Ayala and back. Okay, he said, and went back to work. She thinks you're cute too, Ayala said, sliding back into her seat. I told her how you approve of cannibalism. Hmm. Shit, I did say that, huh? She also likes your haircut. Didn't like when I took credit, though. I can't imagine why. Me neither. Anyway, they're leaving in a couple days. I think you've got a chance. I don't think you understand how stitches work. Ayla, are you okay? Just then, the pair were both jabbed in the back. Ow! They both exclaimed, the hunter on account of his wounds, Ayla from the sheer venom behind the blow. They both turned to see Danica Piercebring, standing bedraggled, face matted with sweat, deep bags hanging under her eyes. She looked for all the world like one of Anissa's husks. She'd just about been worked half to death. Her blue eyes glared at each of them in turn, a whole lecture being conveyed in a couple seconds. Finally, she opened her mouth. He's awake. Ayla and the hunter were frozen to the spot as she moved off to Delphine. Delphine, which room is mine? I can't even remember. The pair sat still for a long time. Ayala gripped her stein in both hands, and the hunter leaned an elbow on the bar and covered his mouth. She bent down and rested her forehead on the rim of her drink. He moved his hands up to cover his eyes. The silence between them stretched and stretched as the energy of the room ramped up all around them. Ladies and gentlemen of Riverwood, called the head musician, it is great to be here. We are the Dancing Horkers. The hunter wiped his face and looked to Ayala, whose eyes were glassy as she stared at the countertop. The music will begin in a moment, but at first I understand that there is some honor to be noted. He threw his arms out to the side where a cluster of yellow sashes had pushed one of theirs into clear view. To Gloston, pikeman of the Whiterun Guard, who two days ago slew the terrible beast of Bleak Falls Barrow, saving not only Riverwood, but possibly the entire hold from its grisly claws. A toast to Gloston! The tavern called back, raising their cups in unison and cheering. In the din that followed, the hunter placed his hand on Ayala's arm. Ayala. The huntress nodded her recognition, but he saw the raw emotion in her eyes. The manic humor of the evening instantly stripped away by clear, crushing relief. He knew how she felt. He too was almost delirious with it. The escalating madness revealed for what it was. Armor. Woefully insufficient, unworthy of either outcome, and now sundered. She took his hand in hers and squeezed enough to rotate the knuckles. He didn't pull away. 
They sat in that quiet release as the soldier's glory crescendoed and subsided. Many thoughts flitted around his mind, but they all flew in orbit of the woman next to him. Are you going to go see him? You go first. Her voice was thick. No, he said. You should go see him. It wasn't a suggestion, but a statement of fact. Why not you? The hunter smiled softly. I have nothing left to say to him. Not really. His voice was creaking like an old wooden floor. And you think I do? Yeah, I do. Well... Ayala met his eyes and she was open. As if split by a blade, she was totally open. Fuck, I'm drunk, she cursed, wiping her face. Here, he slid his water over to her. She took it and greedily drank, slamming the empty mug and wobbling to her feet. She looked at him, eyes shimmering like silver-blue saucers. I... Um... I, I don't... The hunter stood and wrapped her up in his arms. She leaned into it and he kissed her head as she had his. Listen, I get the feeling that you two aren't used to talking like this. But I know what he means to you and I know what you mean to him. This would be a great time to say it out loud. But I shouldn't be there for that. She twisted his shirt in her fists and he felt her nails scraping the small of his back. Go, he said. It'll be okay. I promise. She pulled away and looked him in the eye. He grinned at her, soft and open as she was herself. She pulled him down and kissed his cheek. Thank you, she whispered. You know I don't really feel worthy of that. She smiled. Then you can work on that till I get back. The huntress turned to face Bracknell's room and took a breath. Oh, gods! She huffed and stepped away. A flash of golden hair caught the hunter's eye, and he saw Delphine watching him from across the bar. She smiled and nodded at him. He gave her a shaky grin and a thumbs up. He turned then to watch Ayala as she made her way to Bracknell's door and disappeared inside. He had half expected her to hesitate, to pause at the door and further prepare herself, but she didn't. She was the wolf of Whiterun after all, and once she decided to do something, she did it. He smiled to himself, resolving to follow in her footsteps. He turned back to the bar and stole what was left of her drink. There will come a soldier who carries a mighty sword. He will tear your city down. Oh, lay a lie, oh Lord. Oh, lay a lie, oh lay, oh Lord. He will tear your city down. Oh, lay a lie, oh Lord. There will come a poet whose weapon is a sword. He will slay you with his tongue. Oh, lay a lie, oh Lord. There will come a ruler whose power flees his leg and thorn. Smear with oil like David's boy. Ole, ole, ole. Ole, 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 ole. Smear with oil like David's boy. Ole, ole, ole. Ole, 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 ole. He will tear your city down. Ole, ole.